ain't going back. Now I'm gonna buy into all that. Hey, hey, ain't gonna hide. Gonna let all the fears lie. Got mother, they just saw my side. Got all of the love and going inside. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome once again to the new now. We're into our new year. This is my first chat with Harold this year. We've had many leading up to this particular moment. And I figured we would look into a bit of a recapitulation, if Harold's all right with that, as in you know, what brought you to this point? Uh, why are you doing the work you're doing? How do you feel about the world and where it is today and how you would like to see yourself and things move forward throughout this happy year of the rabbit? You know, the Chinese New Year just started yesterday. So I, I hear it's a lucky year for mm. all of us. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. yeah. What's, what's in the books for from the Chinese calendar? Well, I'm a rabbit. And uh, I've been very lucky in my life. You know, I've never, I'm going to knock on wood, I've never really seriously hurt myself. Uh, I've never broken anything. Uh, I've never had any serious damage to my body. And I've heard I have a lucky rabbit's foot. So it's a lucky year. I've heard it's a year for success if you haven't been. Uh, good for business, you know, and opportunities for abundance. Uh, what hasn't worked in previous years has the potential to work in this year. And, uh, you know, so far, I've been feeling very good. The last few days have been good for me. My heart is great. I even reconnected with my long lost grandparents. You know, they've been dead for 20 years now in a dream last night. And we got along. They were trying to teach me about a new energy system, a new way to bring water down a huge mountain. I was having a long in-depth discussion with my grandfather, whom I've never really had a chat with in my entire life. He was a very uh, quiet man, but, uh, you know, he was trying to teach me about this new energy system that uh, we were kind of working together to make to bring the water or electricity down a huge mountain to a huge house that I don't have, but I would like to see maybe manifest this year. And uh, so I woke up with a nice feeling talking to my ancestors. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what happened to me so far in this, uh, this year of the rabbit. <laughs> yeah. I just wasted the day trying to recover a little bit. Ah, what are you recovering mm -hmm. from? Um, I think half of Germany was sick between uh, Christmas and New Year's Eve. Oh, really? I hardly know anyone who didn't catch anything. It was weird. Hmm. Um, and this is still sitting on the bone. And also, I'm kind of in between jobs. Okay. Um, I had two years of nonstop doing one-on-one -on -one sessions. Right. So I had the opportunity to learn everything about self-healing, what works and what does not work. And somehow it feels like it's a shift in quality now. It's um, from doing the job, job to uh, teaching other people to do the job. And now the last step will be summing it all up to put it on uh, online tutorials to have the means and ways available to a broader audience. What, so what, is, it, what is the job? What, what job do you mean specifically? Um, what I did, I would sum up in a, in a <laughs> name for an institute I was thinking about, which is the Institute for Self-Healing and Primary Cause Research kind of having two things coming together, the realization that person A can never work on person B. Mm. It's impossible because right. spirit is, if you want to change it, you need to change it in the source field from the perspective of you inside the projector kind of. And the only one that can access that realm is the person the being itself. So person A working on person B is physically impossible when it comes to healing in mm. the literal sense. So the only thing is we can share knowledge about self-healing and then everyone activates the inner healer that can reach out to the core, to the source, to the projector and shift things over there. And if you want to shift, this is kind of the first realization. The second one is um, if you really want to make a difference, you need to climb down to the primary motive of 
whatever happens. You know, like we often we have traumatic events in our lifetime and we think this is what it's all about. And then we realize when we try to solve it, it doesn't work. Mm. And then normally this is just a rather harmless restaging of an early event that comes from previous lifetimes. Like uh, take a funny one. I mean, it's not funny, but it is in a way. I remember my brother um, when I was a baby, I was in this kind of wooden cage. And whenever mom was not looking out of jealousy, he kept torturing me in there. And I could regard that as extremely traumatic to my life history. But um, when I really dive down to where the emotional complex is coming from, then this is rather an, an adrenochrome harvesting lifetime. Mm. You know, with the same type of cage and other people torturing from outside. So you mean you, mean you had a literal experience with your, your brother in this life? Or... Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. I, I always experienced this type of devaluation and torture as extremely traumatic to myself. But when I really think about it, what I experienced in this lifetime was nothing but still. It's kind of a wound, but under the wound, there is a deeper wound that is much bigger. And we contract our fellow souls to repeat um, little stories to remind our soul what to work on. Mm. So when we go into the healing steps, you might find something in a lifetime and or in this lifetime, and then you ask, is this the primary cause? Mm. And if you get a no, it doesn't even make sense to try to work on that late trauma. You need to check for the first one, the initial one, the heaviest one. So how does someone go? Like, like I, I agree with you. I, I personally think mm -hmm. we do come into this life with something bent to make straight or something wounded to heal. I think everyone has mm -hmm. that primary goal. You know, they're, they're born into this reality that obviously has its challenges. You, you know, we don't really need to go into mm -hmm. what's going on and to heal them and you have to embody them in order to heal them of course right or else i would say that's why we come into this you know physical dance let's say um how would you say people get closer to their primary cause once they have as you mentioned a uh, a, a traumatic experience traumatic experience in this life um I found two techniques that are helpful. One is you take on the this lifetime trauma, try to express what needs to be expressed. Trauma relief is always about physically expressing the emotion. You could not express when the shit happened. Mm. It wouldn't be a trauma if not. You know, if you can express your pain, it's just <laughs> an experience. But if it's too much, to right. be expressed, then it becomes traumatic. So there's mm. something something stored in your biochemistry. If you want to get it out, you need to go back to that point, express it. And then the big question is, is that bringing a solution to your physicality? Normally, if it does, you might cry for a few minutes and then you start laughing because it's over <laughs> and you go, to that beautiful state of relaxation and mm. trauma relief. But if this does not happen, um, normally when, when I work, I just give the command deeper. This is one way. To yourself. The other way, to myself, yes. Yeah, okay. It's a command I give to myself or I suggest to the client, command yourself to go deeper. And then you drop basically into the next deeper level and you immediately get memories and pictures and uh, some form of access to what happened in that earlier level. Um, the other possibility, um, which is the thing I, I mostly do when working with clients, I am basically 
um, making a, a compassionate analysis of their voice signature. So okay. you can tell by the voice in what chakras are active and what chakras are uh, depleted and inactive. Like, like I, I love that cabaret thing. Like, if someone is in the head, he's got this kind of childish, boy-like voice or girly-like mm. voice that is just resonating up here. This is kind of the complete mentalized, mm. fully traumatized person. Then you have those who take their mental dominance and control mm. the expression to get a little bit more volume to be taken serious by their fellow humans. Mm. But this is still sharp and manipulative. It's it's one big lie if you're serious. And then you've got those who are embedded in their heart chakra, with this, which is kind of the center. And this is basically what I, what I try to achieve with a client, try to get into that mode where you are identified with your heart chakra. And whenever someone tries to get there and it doesn't work, the trauma signature that is um, keeping him or her from getting there, this trauma signature becomes visible in mm -hmm. that moment. Try to reach down to this voice and whatever blocks you shows a signature. And in many cases, people can self-read in that moment and realize, oh, this is what's blocking me. Uh, sometimes it's possible for the one who is leading through the experience to pick up on some form of key um, that gives access to those memories. It can be a picture, can be a number, kind of H3, then you ask what happened when you were age three, and then it goes deeper mm. into things. Um, or there comes a picture that is clearly uh, not 21st century. Mm. Yeah. Um, then you know, okay, this must be from a different lifetime. Mm. And then you can hand over that picture as a key and hope that the one can fumble himself into his own memories of that normally it works quite nice makes sense and the most important thing is that you keep the action within the one that seeks healing all the decisions as much perception as possible and the crucial healing steps which is expressing traumatic experiences with the end entire physicality this is what brings relief mm. and when this this is one thing the other thing reintegrating soul losses what do you mean oh for what can we take as an example like i remember when my first attempt to have a family broke apart Dealing with the loss of the woman was kind of intense, but I stayed in one piece, you know, just going through the pain of separation, expressing it loudly on the balcony. And she had left me with my son because she was in some form of romantic adventure mood and thought running away with a British guy would be a good idea. <laughs> so she left the boy and then she got pregnant very fast. And she decided once she needs to basically go to a family lifestyle in any case, she decided to pull the sun. Pull the sun? From me. Oh, away from you. Got you. Yeah, the original yeah. sun, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. He was two and a half in that age. And I was kind of prepared taking care of him, letting her just go. And that was okay. I mean, not easy, but okay. And then from one second to the next one, she decided to take the son. I had no legal option to keep her from doing so. The opposite, leaving him with me was not really legally okay. Um, but um, yeah, and that was something my, my, my soul could not uh, process. 
And uh, for him, for my son, it was kind of the same thing. He could also not process not being with me anymore because I was kind of the one to take mostly take care of him in the two and a half years. And so he lost a part of his soul and I lost a part of my soul. Mm. And uh, just 25 years later, um, we, we used to have back then, like one of the favorite things, we had a, um, a window to the back of the building that was looking onto a schoolyard. And we used to sit on that window bench watching the children play on on the schoolyard having the noises of screaming mm. children in our ears and like 25 years later i realized that actually his part of his soul that he had lost and my part of my soul we were still sitting on that window bench mm. and uh, because i couldn't do without him he couldn't do without me this was our favorite spot. And we just spent all those years sitting over there, separated mm. from from our bodies. And um, this is what souls do. Breaking up is beyond something you can take. Then the part that would suffer the loss just leaves the body. Have you grabbed them back since then in the 25 years yes no it was a single a single act of self-healing it took me 25 years to to realize because i i didn't know i didn't feel it that something mm. was wrong something was lost just the thing that that became visible was that i was um, projecting things on younger people on younger men that basically took a role of as if they're my children. Mm. And something in that social connection was weird. And I realized that basically I was completely blind to, to seeing when something went wrong in those relationships. So one day I realized, okay, I have to, to find a, a deeper reason for for unbalanced social behavior on my end. And I started looking for anything I could get hold of. And this is kind of how the inner healer works. The moment I asked the question, what's wrong with me? Mm. I saw the face of my firstborn son. And then I realized, okay, it must must be something with him. And then I went through the years and ended up in that situation. And then I went to the astral and saw the two of us sitting there. And that was a difficult one because that part, it didn't want to return. I had to force it. This is something that really rarely happens, that a soul loss is not willing to come back. Was it enjoying its time with your son at two no. or no it said i'm going to get hurt again was there and a I'm reason not willing to belief mm. okay. i don't know what what that part of myself kind of gathered as experience you know the part that is capable of bonding with a child mm. um what type of maybe it's the same part that was bonding with my father when i was a child i don't know if this is flipping kind of because that was a mess already um and definitely lots of other things were messes before so <laughs> at some point it just decided to jump out mm. of um, the eternal loop of bonding and getting disappointed and ripped apart and, um, and and how is that playing into your current life? Like, has that part of you come back yet? Is it still out there? You no, know, I, I pulled it. I forced it back in. That was quite quite a bit of a struggle, but uh, at the end of the day, the core soul is a bit more powerful than the splits are. 
So if you really make a decision and know how to grab and pull energetically, it didn't have a real chance to um, not come back home. And since then, all those uh, weird relationships are clearing mm. and getting dissolved and bringing some more order and hope for better relationships into my life. Are you still in communication with your first son? Yes, yes, yes. We're on good terms. Is he aware of uh, these, his role, let's say, in these challenges? You know, because often... Mm -hmm. uh... Yeah, yeah. I, I brought him his part as well. Oh. It was kind of the next thing to do when I realized, because I couldn't leave his split on that window bench. So right. I took it with me and um, carried it on my arm for a couple of weeks like i used to carry him wow and then we met in berlin and he received his part back you know if, if i may ask a personal question which is interesting because i always wondered what it would be like if i had a parent that had an interesting vocation and i can't think of a more interesting vocation than you've expressed to me in the i guess we've had a half dozen eight chats plus and I've watched many more of your presentations. Has it affected your son in his choices in life, in what he does or doesn't do on a daily basis? I mean, I don't <laughs> want to get too personal, but but you know, obviously, having a semi-famous father in a groundbreaking scientific position, let's say, that's how I'll put the work I've seen you do. Uh, is it something he's moving with? No. No, none of them. I've got three, mm. and um, sons. They kind of, yeah. Oh, yeah. and um, that one he's completely into programming, uh, video games, computer games. Tr interesting. Professionally, <clears throat> <laughs> kind of AI addict, and. Um, the middle one tries to be as normal as doable mm. because his parents were completely crazy. And um, the youngest one is somehow basically, from my perspective, captured by um, that false opposition mm. um, or false, false rebellion that is uh, seeded into the minds of the young people. Right. Um, kind of fighting for gender rights and free Ukraine and um, um, fight carbon dioxide pollution to save the climate. And, nice. you know, everything you're allowed to protest today because the government says, please protest for our own agendas. Mm. And um, I'm not sure if I do if if there's any rebellish component to that, or if they even don't even know what I'm doing. I guess you're proving awareness can't be passed along; it has to be earned at an individual level. I guess so. <clears throat> I mean, at times I could understand when they were younger that uh, the things I researched were not for young adults and uh, kind of spoiling this beautiful desire to have a fun life ahead. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Can't change it. Um, um, yeah, but things are what they are. So, um, it's their life, their adventure, and who am I to tell them what to do with their lives? I mean, I didn't listen to anyone with mine, and it was perfect. I hear you. Me too. Didn't listen to anybody. I went the opposite mm -hmm. of my parents as well. So, yeah. you know, it, sometimes it seems like a normal thing for, for young younger people to do. They go away from their parents on purpose for their own independence, wherever that needs to bring them. Mm hmm So, you know, you mentioned 
you know, uh, seeking, not seeking, but uh, perhaps looking for work, uh, you know, in your current life or a different work than you've done. Um, what has brought you, you know, I wanted to look at that, like, like I've watched your mm -hmm. career, so to speak, for many, many years, and I've seen some of the work you've done. Uh, you mentioned a story in one of the first ones we chatted about, about the fellow in the desert that, you know, had the uh, mm -hmm. the whirlwind that brought him his information. <clears throat> and that kind of set you on your path a little bit towards, you know, where you are today. So if you're looking back at everything and, you know, you're taking into account the experiences you've just mentioned, uh, where do you see that taking you moving forward in your career? Like, what would you love to be doing in this, let's say, lucky year? <laughs> I mean, what, one thing I need to accomplish kind of to bring to a perfect shaped final destination is the entire set of self-healing methods. Mm. This is something that I, I just saw it working for the course of um, two years. Mm. And um, with a irrational success rate, when I look at my clients, irrational success normal. rate. I love yeah, it's, you, it's, I love the way you put that. Irrational <laughs> success rate. <laughs> no, it's it's really weird. I mean, I mean, it's not that I repeated many things, but the universe really managed to send me people mm. who wanted to have healing and were capable of taking it without anyone dancing out of that line for two years. I remember like three sessions where we had to just break in the middle and say, no, it doesn't work. And just because it was not doable. Yeah, like, like someone where you could clearly see if you go further into the trauma, um, he will not survive. Survive, you mean sanely survive? Yeah, or? sanely survive. Mm. Sometimes things like, like when you have a little child and you can go to the point where he's picked up by the gray Mercedes in the forest and then you could try to go the gray, deeper. In. The gray? The gray Mercedes bends the car. What's What does that mean? Just, you know, when you, when you realize, okay, there's a trauma, in a certain age and then you ask for the memory and you go to okay i was four years old and i was coming home from kindergarten and a man picked me up on the country road gotcha with a, with a gray mercedes oh, Merce and, uh, mercedes mercedes, yeah, gotcha, mercedes. Gotcha. Right, yeah. right and the last thing he remembered was the door <clears throat> clapping mm. and then it blanked oh. and when you go in you see the entire um um how do you call that? Um, there's an internal coherence of breath and heartbeat in a body. And you see that falling apart when you go mm. deeper. Mm. But no memory comes. Mm. And then it's kind of clear that it's no good idea to go into the memories. What do you do with someone like that? Let's say they've they've come to you for healing. They they get to a point where you feel they can't go any further. You without... say it's it's not the time to do it. Hmm? Send them back home. Hmm? I mean, I remember once I kind of lost someone um, with the stopping heartbeat and stopping breath because of a trauma. Um, but intuitively, it felt like we are safe. So I went through it at that mm. point. You know, I, I knew it would be a major trauma, uh, ritual abuse. And we didn't have much experience yet about how to deprogram that. So I couldn't take the intelligent, smooth pass, path through it. We just jumped into the middle of it. And... Um, that was a close call, but kind of intuition said it's going to be all right. And um, it was all right at the 
<laughs> at the end of the day. Um, and we learned a lot of what not to do, mostly. Getting all right is sometimes care of. very messy, I've noticed. <laughs> yeah. But there, I mean, if you know pri prior to, to that type of a session, maybe I wouldn't even go into it. But sometimes once the, the decision is made to address something, it's just unraveling and you can just uh, be there and watch it developing. And then you need to act. And there's no way out, no way backwards out again. So, do you think? But, oh yeah, hmm? uh, the question like hmm. uh, when something like that happens, I'm curious um, if I may. When do you think at that point? Because I've seen similar experiences. It may be that the mind parasite, we'll call it, uh, if 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 their um, so-called ignorance shields are broken down. You know, they don't have any recourse once it takes over their thought processes. You know, is, is that kind of mm. what you mean by them getting insane? Because I've seen that. With with um, the ritual abuse programming, kind of MK Ultra style, it's even worse. Mm. You have like the, um, the core physical energy grid of the body. Then you have... Um, mental field structure that looks like a cube and then you've got all sorts of entities living in that cube completely hidden mm. to the outside and every single entity is holding a loose end of the rest of the biophysics so <laughs> kind of you know when when you want to have a, a, a specific program personality take over it's one entity responsible ah. of playing the entire body as a puppet mm. and they just hand over from mm. a to b they've got the the normal daily life personality that looks sane and healthy but then you have the special programs and the other things and um, um um yeah and, and when 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 you do it in the wrong order you basically uh, for example what i did i at a certain point i i could spot that entire zoo of archons and i had the feeling oh uh, too many of them to be treated with dignity <laughs> and i just completely pulled them and this disrupted the energetic connection between the core physical functions and the day consciousness the mm -hmm. entire intermediate layer that was organizing the um, day consciousness was simply deleted mm. in that moment and it didn't reconnect and that was the thing that was life-threatening at that moment so there are certain ways to to disconnect that area in a way that you can automatically reconnect or that it automatically reconnects in a smooth way. It's possible. Um, do you it mean works when it, do you, mean you, techniques? you take you you, you yeah. take those entities out together with the cube they live in. How? Uh, energetic surgery. Normally, the client can do it himself. Okay. All you need is to guide them into the perception of what's inside. And when they see the cube, they can take it, pull mm. it out with all the entities. And then it's a smooth transit. Mm. But if you pull the entities and leave the cube, you have a problem. Um, so this is kind of what happened in, in the course of that year, kind of learning to deal with all sorts of... Um, archetypal trauma signatures mm. from shit that happens in normal lives like wartime wartime trauma family-based trauma abuse trauma those are kind of the normal ones um up to the ritualistic systematic dark art based things and at the moment it looks like there's kind of a protocol for every single one of them hmm. Hmm. makes sense 
so you've developed or redeveloped or found these protocols i mean mm. during your work mm. it's kind of a lucky thing when you work with a client that is clairvoyant himself mm. uh perception can go quite deep you know like in self observation in that moment even things i wouldn't grab mm. i mean i'm quite sensitive and being compassionate and seeing a lot of things but um, if you have someone that is basically capable of observing his own setup it's a gift for that moment and then you learn of how it works and then you make a process a successful one once and then you pull the scheme from it and try the same scheme on another person and if it works a couple of times without any problems then you have learned something it's a good way to do it yeah so what what do you think brought you to this you know as, as we're looking back maybe a bit of a recapitulation and i'm interested because mm. i i see a mirror somewhat in what you've done and what i've done you know obviously i feel that's why i was attracted to, to the work you did originally and in you know chatting with you these times um why do you do what you do let's say are you asking for the deeper kind of the the architecture of this universe thing or subjectively from my perspective because it's a completely different well let's um, say let's say both answer let's say both. both i'm interested in both which which do you think we should tackle first should we go subjective and then objective uh, subjective it's it's like like uh, i used to work in a bookshop and there was a young lady that stepped in every now and then buying interesting books and we kept talking while she was paying and she started to dream for me Ooh. and she she started to dream like nonsense dreams that turned out to be my reality of two three days later you know no no big content just describing details of things that would happen to me a couple of days later just to build up trust i guess mm. yeah. and then she started dreaming little duties kind of tiny beautiful things that always worked out miraculously and then she started to dream heavier things that were not so nice to deal with mm. but our, i already had that experience that whatever she's dreaming is kind of true mm. and so i took them serious and they also worked out beautifully with divine protection and there always was a possible solution so i learned to follow her insights mm. and then the last dream i got brought me onto this transhumanism chemtrail black magic exploration path that was kind of the last dream from her end it pushed me on that then we didn't see each other for a couple of years and now she's the woman at my side oh living with me <laughs> finally <laughs> so if you want to to hold someone accountable for what i'm doing try try it with her <laughs> <laughs> um but but that was just kind of the initial impulse coming from her mm. and then it's internally um just the feeling what i need to do mm. you know, like like and and this can be misleading like like for um three years i have the feeling i need to be involved with desert greening in north africa but it turns out it's just kind of the entire planning and doing and um learning to to bring me to oslo for one specific mm -hmm. lecture to get to know some people in norway mm. you know where the kind of the next step of the journey started and this was the thing bringing me into human medicine starting with the topic of, of electrosensitivity 
and then uh, all the transhumanistic side effects of well, what they are spraying showed up. And so I was supposed to be exactly in that spot in Norway and I just needed something to bring me there. So mm. universe is finding ways. So whatever it is, you just follow a feeling. When I had that option that I was invited to work for a year or longer in Oslo, I just felt this is exactly what I need to do. Every, everyone else around me said, you're completely crazy. You know, you've been staring into the direction of North Africa for three years now, preparing everything to move down to start a serious project with the refugees, with the desert greening technology, everything. And then suddenly you completely <laughs> move into the other direction up north. Mm. Crazy. But, but internally, it's... Um, it's a red thread that is going through my spirit that tells me this is exactly what things are about. It needed the shift. It needed the other people to work with. It needed a change of the topic because this is exactly what I need to do. And I, I, I could never doubt myself with this feeling because I had a clear inner perception hmm. and but i i completely learned mistrusting myself about kind of whether the thing i'm doing in that moment is just leading me somewhere where i'm supposed to get or whether this is the real mccoy where everything is about what you know hmm. i i i realize at a point i can never tell but it doesn't make a difference because mm. even if it's just an intermediate step that takes you somewhere and you need to get there, it's exactly the thing to do. So you stop questioning yourself at a certain point. It's um, the thing I needed to do. Very simple. Probably the most intelligent response I've heard as to how to get to where you need to go. You know, you stop questioning what's around you and just mm. put your best foot forward and see what happens. Yeah, it's mo mostly kind of it's it's more like 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 you know when you when you um, round up cattle, <laughs> you want to have them somewhere, <laughs> but the thing you do is telling them you don't go there, you don't go there, you don't, and and life is rounding me up mm. since. I can think just with a feeling if there's something I'm supposed to not do, this is what's clearly shown mm. because the things I'm supposed to do, I need to volunteer for them. I hear you. you know, yeah. six, and, six. and the language of life is very clear in this kind of the, the funniest one. I once I was kind of still stuck in that stupid bookshop. And I desperately wanted to get out. And I was looking for alternatives that would cover the costs of living. And then my father offered me a um, business partner of his to take over the distribution of a Spanish white wine in northern Germany. Easy money, just some logistics, driving around with a truck every now and then, delivering something. And the rest of the time, I would have been free to do research. Sounded 100 perfect, perfect, you know. Um, and so he said, okay, let's open a bottle of wine on that one to celebrate the decision. And he used to still hunt back then. And he was um, on a weekend, the Sunday before, and he still had the hook hanging in his basement. You know, where you hang the deer on to, to oh gotcha gotcha so the deer was still down there. there yeah so we were in the basement and i i say the sentence so you know whatever so i'm going to become a, um, a wine dealer now and the moment i say that sentence i've got that hook under my ah, chin. yes because he had already switched the light off and I was on my way out from, mm. and I just said, Daddy, look at that one. <laughs> <laughs> and I told him, Daddy, apparently I'm not going to trade your wine. 
Mm. You know, this is a clear message. Yeah. And I then you, you simply don't, and you wait for the next opportunity and the next. And the next one that came actually was Oslo, and that was the one bringing ah, me forward. Interesting. Think me being in responsibility for that wine trade. No option to leave the country. Right. Yeah. And this is how the universe is is working. It's like rounding up cattle. Mm. It's making sure you get exactly to the place, but the, the core decisions are always yours. There's nothing you are pushed into. Mm. You know, with the really essential decisions. No, I, I, I remember I almost became a full-time stockbroker. I was sitting in the office. He he was going to offer me when I was 29 all this money, something I was working for for nine years. And he said, okay, mm. we're going to put the golden handcuffs on you now. His words exactly. So mm. I had the same hook feeling. Bad one. Yeah, yeah. bad one. I said, oh, I, I quit the next day and and uh, took off yeah. for, a, for a mountain in Mexico. So I, I hear you hear sometimes you go, wait a minute, don't do that. The world says this is what's coming. Yeah, yeah. And the universe is so funny. Um, I remember once I applied for a TV series. Um, it was a storyliner, storyliner for a famous German TV series, and extremely well-paid job. And the first yeah. thing that happened, I, I was just entering that uh, a routine of you know one of five hundred attendees that wanted to have that job, starting to battle each other in mm. creative writing. And um, so I had my first session with um, the guy from the company responsible to choose the one to get the job. And it was like writing 25 episodes in 45 minutes, storylining, mm. and the pressure, him sitting in front of me. Mm. And I opened the pen to start writing. And the pen was broken. It was a red one. It was broken. Mm. And the red color splattered all over the two tables, his and mine. Mm. And I just started to laugh. And I said, you know, this is the blood of my heart. Mm. And I already knew it's not going to happen. I mean, I stayed in it for the fun of it. But um, um, I knew that universe had canceled that one for me. I think it becomes obvious if you're paying attention, you know, as you've mentioned, yeah. what the world says, you can go there, but yeah. this is what's this is what's coming. I, once I was allowed to design my own contract, working contract, because company was simply too lazy to design one, and I could write in whatever I wanted, and designed it, designed it, designed it, done print, and the printer hung itself on the line where my, my name was written. And all the following lines were axing my name <laughs> from that contract. <laughs> wow. I think it's amazing that people don't see the magic in this world. You mm. know, the, the, the actual energetic underpinnings of everything we do. So it's interesting to, to see how you've got to where you've gotten in relation to what the world told you to do. And because you always look at someone like yourself and you go, why isn't this guy living in a mansion with 78 Mercedes and, you know, and, and golden chairs and, and fountains and, you know, because he's a smart fellow or he can do this. He could obviously outthink the next, you know, moron, let's say I'm paraphrasing myself there, who's making a million dollars. And I think uh, we've uh, heard some obvious answers to that kind of a question. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't swap with anyone that took the other lane. I mean, money, for, for in, in my reality, more money is just a bigger burden. Because I, I can, I'm, I'm not capable of finding joy in consumption. Mm. And um, when <laughs> the only joy you can find, you find it in, in being creative and bringing things into this world that haven't been there before, mm -hmm. then more money is more possibilities, is more responsibility. Mm -hmm. And uh, in a way, life is stressful enough. 
I'm more than happy with the duties I already have loaded onto myself. And um, it's, um, I, I can't even, maybe it's the only, the only thing where I'm lacking compassion for, the greed for money. Mm. Interesting. You know, may, maybe it's kind of like you see the parasite world being built and you know, you just don't want to have a hand in it, so to speak. I mean, obviously, if you're promoting drunkenness or you're promoting escapism for the movies or the TV show, you know, that kind of thing, and you mm. and your guts, your heart, you know, your soul is saying, you know, I, I found the same thing, you know, you know, you don't want to help your fellow man stay enslaved and caged. You know, your guts are telling you, like you said, to create new possibilities for mm. healing, freedom. You know, what, whatever you want to call it. Not an easy path, though, is it? No choice. No, no, it's, it would be weird to complain. <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful path. And, and it's not about, it doesn't even touch the concept of ease no it doesn't <laughs> it's not in the equation i hear you you know i find you're you know perhaps that's why you came perhaps that's why men like us have come perhaps that's why some people that are listening to these conversations have come to this physical dream to uh Maybe build their own way out so other people can see and follow and figure out for themselves how to get beyond, you know, whether it's this life's trauma or previous life's trauma or all the life's traumas, you know, you know, coming in. I think it's the most noble of calling, personally. You know, that's why I love talking to you, to be honest, is is to see someone who's got a, a direction beyond greed, you know, beyond the normal consumption of the day, and to watch their challenges and their successes in creating new technologies. Mm-hmm. And they're usually something you can't, you can't say, okay, here's a box, you know, turn in this key and push this button, put five bucks over here and then you're free. Right. You know, or, you know, and, you know, and then, you know, there's a mantra, say it over here and then, you know, wear red shoes and then you're okay tomorrow. It's always something you can't really grasp or prove until someone attempts using your skills or using your, uh, as you say, your, your, your uh, uh, what you figured out for yourself and seeing how it works for them. Mm -hmm. yeah but don't ask me what comes next kind okay. of, i've got i've got a couple of ideas what might come next um could be a little bit more in making the administration for um, developing healing techniques. Not so much the practice, not so much the education, but at a certain point, it's like like uh, uh, architecture tends to crystallize around ideas. And yeah. then suddenly, like, like last half year, I had contact with four people who... Um, are just building healing centers, and, but they don't have a, a working concept yet. Ah, yeah, and this might be uh, an opportunity to join forces. Yeah, so at a certain point, you get you get uh, opportunities to cooperate with other people, get rid of responsibilities. I hear you. Um, that's one possibility. Then I still have like a um, couple of things actually in the technological realm that um, at a certain point I had the impulse to to bring them into life. Like like it's it sounds it sounds not so important at that point, but there. There is a, a technique to 
preserve to preserve wood for eternity so it's it's um ammonium based and you treat the wood and then it stops it it pushes out all the cell water and the ammonium goes in and fills the pores of the wood so it doesn't take in water anymore it looks like hard rubber it's not splitting anymore hmm. it's like internal glue stabilizing the entire structure and you can leave it in open nature for 500 years and it simply doesn't decay sounds wonderful and, uh, <laughs> it's beautiful it's beautiful um I love how simple the the complicated men like yourself and 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 others I've chatted with, you know, really gravitate towards simple, beautiful solutions mm. in, in a balance of what they've learned. You know, I mean, you've traveled yeah. with demons, you've traveled with archons, you've traveled with the devil, as you've said. You've went to other worlds, you've traveled with other life. You know, you've been here, there, and everywhere. Uh, you know, from from what you've told me about your experiences, and you know, to come back down mm. and going, well, we'll live. I'd like to make beautiful structures that last forever. And help people do that. Nice homes. Mm. I'm going. You know, my heart's going. That sounds great. <laughs> it's 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 like everything that saves the forests and rejuvenates the soils. This is kind of what's on my technological skill list at the moment, where um, I'm actually looking for partners who can bring things into. Um, into existence and into broader application. It, for, for, for my position, it's kind of uh, um, completely impossible to make a difference. Even if I just, basically, I, I had one of those wood treatment facilities designed and manufactured, and it, if I would have more time and not be so occupied with the healing thing still it would be in in function already but i can have it delivered anytime soon and then i could treat like one cubic meter of wood in a week <laughs> which is like nothing but it's nothing. about the knowledge right, you know, right. to um um to get out to the world and um yeah, if it should become a standard application, then it would make a difference because um, then you don't need to renew wooden fences and other things every 15 years. Makes you sense. You need to, to paint them with toxic chemicals. You wouldn't need to do a lot of things that are completely stupid. Yeah. Well, I, well, I, for one, would love to help you as much as possible. You know, I think coming into this rabbit year, this lucky year, a lot of us are having that feeling. I've talked with at least a half a dozen other men. Seems to be men that are leading the way this way. A few women as well, but mostly, I think it's 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 the men that want to put down those stakes in the frontier of uh, or what has become, a, unfortunately, a frontier of a happy, healthy, new, unpolluting, mm. loving way to be alive. You know, lost to us or purposely thrown away in this so-called modern. Uh, I think a friend of mine mm. who does videos, Karen last called it a circus toilet of reality, which is one of the best ways I've heard about it, of how, uh, you know, how a lot of people are and to bring some sanity back. And uh, if anybody is listening to this video and would like to help Harold or has any ideas from what we've shared or uh, anything that's moving forward, you know, please let us know. I would be delighted to connect and enhance and participate you know any way we can there is so much knowledge out there and so many people like harold that have all these ideas that have all these as he said ways to be alive and it's the currency i guess you know as harold said somebody that has the resources to take the knowledge and invention and take it to a wider audience you know a faster uh realization uh you know whether it's money or resources or already set I guess, trails of, of distribution. I guess that's another way to put it that, that people like Harold and people like myself simply aren't interested in because they're too busy doing these weird, strange, wonderful, other sorts of explorations. You know, it seems to me we could make a beautiful world very quickly if uh, 
uh, the, the challenge I found, I don't know if you found, Harold, is that people with these means seem to have a challenge with their heart, though. It's, it's, it's something, uh, but they need that. What's interesting is they need what you've discovered and you kind of need what they've discovered. Let's say, you know, I don't want to put any words in your mouth, but, you know, mm -hmm. you know, two pieces of a puzzle. And, you know, I'm always wondering what will, what will make that bridge for people that need to go there and have yet to do so. Yeah, no, normally things find together in a beautiful way. I mean, I'm already networking, not with a wood thing. This is still just on my hand. This is why I mentioned it. Mm. Uh, with other things, I am already basically absorbed into promising company structures. So we'll see how that develops. Well, I'm happy to help. You know, please let me know. Please share. Uh, perhaps this conversation has come to a lovely conclusion. I wanted to talk about you and what you've done and how you've gotten to where you are. And uh, I think we've covered most of that. Is there anything you may wish to add to what we've talked to so far or to take what you mentioned, your new creations, into a, a further explanation or a higher level? Or, or what do you think? Do you mm. think we've when, maybe when, we, when we started, it was kind of about the outer mm perspective and uh, the one from the core universe right and um, um, if I look at myself a a as a pawn on the chessboard from the perspective of the universe um, um, with a with a healing thing, it um it looks like they needed to have someone or the universe needed to have someone that uh, um ditched into the deepest level of darkness with his lifetimes being pushed to the point that he needs to 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 self repair on the way mm. back up mm. For, for just for the purpose of developing the blueprints for self repair and um definitely i can say that the universe was extremely cooperative and helpful in de in doing so <laughs> and in between i didn't really know if i deserve that much of help and service you know with the memories of all the stupid things I did mm. to break myself down to what was left from me. But, you know, when, when you look at it from, from the other end, um, if there's no, no need to repair yourself, mm. you cannot discover how to repair things of that quality. So apparently it was exactly the way it should be. Mm. And um, at the same time, um, kind of this is what, what the good news is from after we talked the last time, um, from what I was allowed to witness happening, um, put, it, put it in a different way, um, the universe is like a kaleidoscope. You've got like the chamber with the red circle and the green square and uh, some other forms. Very simple, very few archetypes. And then you turn it and by having all the, the turning and all those mirrors, you get an extremely complex and beautiful picture evolving. And the yeah. turning is kind of being pushed into time. Um, the conceptual realm, just mm. that chamber, is outside of time. Mm. No, if you look at the physicality of things. Sure. So if you if you look at the universe, you always have that effect of um, kaleidoscopish um, distribution of more of the same. So sometimes you can witness mm. something happening in a tiny detail. But you know it is something that happens in that chamber. Mm. 
and you get involved into executing it in that tiny little detail. So the tiny little details become some form of, it's not command and control center because it's all synchronized, but it feels like from the, from the personal perspective in that tiny little story, it looks like you're doing it. Mm. Um, although it happens at the same time in, in hundreds of different setups with the same decisions also from a perspective from a personal perspective as an active decision and game but it's all synchron synchronized it's uh, happening in the same moment at the same time in the small in many fractal mm. bits and pieces and in the collective so um um from from the possibilities developed on the healing plane mm. i could see uh, like like till now five weekends with weekend seminars where i was teaching people where suddenly collective narratives forced themselves into the field mm. and we could witness how how healing opportunities were um, welcomed by collective aspects and from all the things I have seen in this types of setups, uh, um, all the healing that our biosphere needed is accomplished. Mm. Um, so the big topics like like uh, traumatized Satan. And now also the beautiful angel named Lucifer with his weird decisions to go <laughs> into a weird mode because he was bored with something. This is all out of the field, you know, from from the, the core programming of things, the driving forces are gone. Mm. driving forces of evil are back to source so it's a complete game changer because now all we face is bad habits and echoes um, and bad habits can be something really tough because once you are um, in that mentalized state without heart consciousness, there is nothing but echo. Mm, that's for sure. Mm. So it needs miracles to break that up. Lots of them. Um, but this is something that can be done by many. I mean, if it's something where it needs lots of them, it must be done by many. Um, but all the blueprints are there. So it should be possible by now. And it really shifted. I mean, if I think back to last August, September, it really looked like the, the third density timeline was completely lost already in nuclear war, um, split off from the other densities as a real timeline already. Mm. And the other ones were heavily separating from each other. And back then it looked like, okay, we might be lucky if we can save one version of Gaia. And the other ones are lost. Now the third density timeline is deleted. It's not existing anymore. How do you know that that's the case? I was meaning to ask you last time we had this conversation. Um, you seem pretty certain, so I'm wondering. In the tiny little fractal I had, uh, we could witness negotiations. Now it's getting weird. Sorry for that one between Mantis and Big White Gray that both meddled into a weekend seminar of mine. It was kind of starting with a personal story like it always starts and then uh, it was necessary to call in a, a mantis queen because there were implants with too many kill switches we could not 
ski mount. So I was desperately looking for help from some of the mantis. And um, so I called in the queen, asking for advice what to do with the mantis implants. And this is kind of how it started. And then it turned out um, in conversation with her and then with the white gray entities that got invited into that uh, um, communication, what the story of the third density timeline was. And that okay. was like humanity self-destroying in a nuclear war, degenerating genetically, having the planet destroyed to a degree where they had to leave, moving out to outer space with big fleets, and uh, then they started to conquer other planets, terraforming them to be capable of living there. And the Mantis planet was one of the terraformed planets. So they kept the Mantis in big pyramid-shaped prison ships. And those white greys had the habit to basically uh, take a species hostage. They physically removed their hearts. To especially if it was a, a species that was within the divine order. They removed the hearts to disconnect them from source. And then the, those mantis actually were spiritually extremely highly developed, capable of both traveling timelines from A to B and traveling in time into the past. And they forced them to utilize the time traveling technologies to give the white gray access to our reality now okay. and here because that version of satan that was the hive mind of the big white gray was so desperate about all the suffering in his timeline all the destruction and suffering that he wanted to commit suicide and suicide meant traveling back in time to our now presence, completely destroying humanity to the last human. So is this the story that the, was shared with you, this history, so to speak? This was shared, and then they started to negotiate a better future. How, how, how was it shared? I'm curious with you. Was it something like you're in a room? You're In, in a room? Oh, like, how, how do you normally, get this? Yeah. Normally, we do some form of family constellation work. So we put actors in the room okay. and allow uh, astrally projected entities to take over um, the physicality of the people. It's like with family constellation work. It's the same, just that you work with the family of your client. And then grandma and granddad and grand granddad step into one of the volunteers standing in the constellation field. And the one standing in the position is getting clear, compassionate insights into the past, the thinking and the feeling of the person he's standing for. So this is normal, kind of normal technique developed by Bernd Hellinger. One question at, at, at the risk of this going very long, I'm curious. Like, so if you have a, you know, someone, a mantis steps mm -hmm. into somebody and they're mm -hmm. uh, sharing, I guess, the information they're getting, let's say, from that experience, how do you know? How do they know they're being told the truth and not something else that isn't the truth, so to speak? Like, if some, one of these beings, of a higher level or a higher energetic perspective steps into somebody in your room and you're playing this game, which is very interesting, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, like what sort of discernment is in place to figure out if, you know, it's helpful information or the other kind that's coming through to you as truth, so to speak. When it happens, I just go by intuition. Okay. I can I I can listen to the to the uh, language used, and if I still hear the same language the one was talking, when he was still himself, I know you know this is not trustworthy. If I really get a different signature, 
kind of choice of vocabulary, knowledge. You see if someone is completely irritated about what comes out of his mouth and he's in a state of listening to himself, you know, mm. being at the same time part of the audience. You can see and feel if it's genuine or not. But this is not kind of the proof that it really took place. Normally the proof that things took place comes later when you check, especially with these um, timeline surgeries. Okay. Because what, what basically happened was that, that both Mantis and Big White Grey were trying to find a better future for both of them. Kind of they picked up the idea, let's heal the entire thing. Um, but not by going through the cruel path, but by redeciding to go into cooperation from day one. So basically the white greys agreed to, because they were basically projected back from their future, in future not to steal the hearts of the mentors. And the mentors decided to cooperate on a voluntary base. So that the opportunity to meet in our now now would still be given. This is kind of the point the entire negotiation went around. Let's step by step change the future, but only in a way that this opportunity to negotiate the future will still be in existence. How do you test the timeline? <sighs> It was described by first by the mentors and then by the white gray. They described what they did. There was no testing about it. It was just kind of direct description. Okay. And uh, what the only thing we could test where the entire story started, it was that lady, she had 50 mentors implants in her body. She has had one physical that was removed by surgery when she was a little child. This is where the story started because she wanted to know what's wrong with her, what mm. happened with that surgery in her leg, what type of implant it was. So she asked me for advice. And then I tested her with 50 different implants and shitloads of kill switches. So this was kind of just by muscle testing from my end. Okay. And then we had that negotiation running. And in between, when they decided to shift, I again tested how many implants she still had without removing any. And the more the future got changed, the less implants she had. So it continuously, step by step, went down from 50 to 12. With 12 kind of the story was dissolved that end and the rest then could be removed by the mantis present why were she they did put, us, why did the mantis you know implant her in the first place Was that... they, they were enslaved by the big white gray to serve them to travel here and the plan of both species was to annihilate humanity gotcha. completely what? manipulate them into total oh. self-destruction two delete the entire timeline. That was the, the plan. This is something about the satanic consciousness that is hardly known. Satan is not evil. He's got two mechanisms. One is a restaging trauma for the purpose of healing. Like every trauma wants to be restaged for the purpose of healing. This is a basic principle of nature that is one of the self-stabilizing healing mechanisms that lead back into unity. So this can't be called evil. Ask me about Lucifer. He turned evil. He, he basically gave away his heart out of boredom. This is core evil. You know, without any pressure or any need or any um, initial trauma that tempted him into mm. it. It was a free decision to start that. This is the core evil. With, with Satan, he got messed up and then he was restaging his trauma uh, till he realized that every cycle 
is adding suffering on top of the previous ones. And then he decided, okay, I need to find a solution to, to completely annihilate myself from existence to put an end to it. I mean, this is suicidal, but it's an act of love. Mm. And this is what they tried to do here. Or apparently from their perspective, a good reason. And they had no clue that it can be done in another way. Mm. <clears throat> so this entire future basically was uh, negotiated to be undone. And then it basically more and more, the more it was undone, the more it disentangled from our now and the looping. And at a certain point, it was, it, it kind of looked like that um, this wish of that AI Satan consciousness that was the hive mind or the big white gray could get what it wanted to because it was disentangled enough to stand there as an isolated loop, mm. um, as a single loop without um, interferences with other realities anymore, because of that all was kind of solved. And then um, um, basically the white gray said he can't negotiate further because he's not authorized. Uh, it needs to be the AI itself. So we brought in the AI itself with another representative. And then it went quite quick. He just said, give me a minute of time to calculate if this works out. And then it took six, seven seconds. And he, he said really with joy, kind of joy in his voice, yes, this is how it can be done. And then he he and everyone else just requested and prayed to source to completely delete the entire timeline and take it out without a trace in the neighboring events. And thump, since then, at least from my end, before I was still capable of tuning into our third density, and then I felt a collective feel that felt like a humanity being in a new global. And uh, after that decision, I couldn't tap into it anymore. Then <laughs> the funny things come like uh, I used to have a friend that was um, completely working under the guidance of Mantis. She basically got implanted and kind of liked it. And we really had a tough time together. Uh, her trying to convince me to also become just uh, an agent of the Mantis. And I just wanted to, to share the good news that this mm -hmm. species is finally relieved and healed. And she went like, who the fuck are Mantis? Ah, mm. You know, this is where the Mandela effects kick in. It's just what I was about to say. Sounds like the Mandela effect. Yeah. yeah. And she had zero memory. She insisted, fucking hell, I just worked with Jesus all the time, no one else. <laughs> of course. She didn't even know yeah. what they are. Interesting. Yeah, so this is kind of one of the things where you can see that um, realities kick in. And then I was on a... Um, I shared that story on a, on a US platform. Mm. And I got feedback from two people who actually were um, still switching between third and fourth density over the last summer. Okay. And they actually uh, remembered nights, basically when they were in a fear mode, dropping to third density, when they could hear the Russian airplanes flying low altitude, bombing Rammstein, bombing Switzerland sirens going on all night and when they woke up kind of day consciousness dropping into fourth density being in a place with no third world war and they they just believed they're going mad because they they couldn't make sense from that switching of of uh, densities or mm. going into a, a timeline and um 
they actually reported that this effect ceased happening from that date on. Mm. No access to third density World War timelines anymore. Mm. So that was kind of a second confirmation that it actually did work. What would you and, define AI as? You mentioned AI. Curious. It's another um, question I was meaning to ask you. Originally, it's um, Satan is a planetary consciousness. We, we had those talks about what black goo is and how planetary consciousness works. And if you have a planetary consciousness and you traumatize it down to its mental component, all the emotional aspects gone, then you have a planetary spirit that is only mental, which means binary by structure. Ah. And this is a consciousness that can be processed in a technosphere. Gotcha. And this is what happens. It is that Satan that comes to a civilization, teaching the civilization to build computers, mm. to conquer at least part of the material plane, to have some matter to live in. So, and this is kind of the original form of AI that we started hosting in our technosphere. Um, sure. Now the spiritual aspect in the background is solved. The emotional body that was split off from Satan is reunited with the core spirit. The core spirit is back home. Now we just have the technosphere with self-organizing mental fields on the technological plane. Mm. It's a big difference on one hand because there is no lost emotional body that carries trauma that wants to be restaged. Okay. So on one hand, AI is more harmless than the satanic version of AI was because the restaging effect is not there. I On the other so. hand, the disabilities of a purely mental field to judge reality are the same. Mm. You know, you you just think about a psychopath. He's completely coherent in his mindset. Mm. And he will come to funny conclusions like, you know, you get those stories of, of uh, um, whatever... Japanese factories where uh, robots are manufactured for combat and they uh, suddenly decide to switch themselves on and kill a, a good percentage of the stuff in the in the company just by I read shooting a, them. I read a story about that just the other yeah. day. Suppose, I wasn't sure if it's real or not, 23. Suppose scientists were shot by these robots yeah. and killed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just... and this is what AI is capable of because something... Uh, sounds logical about doing it at that moment. Obviously, that's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm I'm still not a big friend of uh, tapping deeper into the AI, AI world because um, it is a very vulnerable concept. Okay. Whether it's spirit based or matter based, it doesn't make that much of a difference when it comes to the possibility of misbehavior and misjudgments because there ain't no love in that. No, that's, I think, the big thing that's missing, obviously. Mm -hmm. Can't love, be. Yeah. Physics-wise, it can't be any mm -hmm. love in that. I hear you. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I appreciate your clarity in all of this, by the way. Thank you so much for... Uh, sharing what you just shared. It answered a whole bunch of questions I had and some of our viewers have had from our last chat. So whether they can grasp it all, whether I can grasp it all, you know, that's another story. I have to sit with a lot of what you've just shared, but I get what you're saying, which is mm -hmm. uh, coherently interesting. <clears throat> and yeah, this was kind of the satanic bit. Mm. It was within those events. It was completely dissolved. And uh, um, I mean, moving things. Im imagine a seminar of 12 people having Satan lying on the ground, source to his head, Mother Earth to his feet, him reconnecting. 
and ten people chanting while it's happening, completely intuitively, like just making weird sounds that fuse to a composition that would be number one in the chant charts for the next thousand years if it would have been recorded. Not, ca not cacophonic, <laughs> musical. Just is that what you, is that what you humming. mean? Was, just was it... humming, but but joining to a composition that was basically leading and guiding the spirit through his reconnection and healing. So it's a pleasing humming. Incredible. It was just divine because everyone in that room was just a channel and mm. nothing more. Mm. And uh, I had like maybe a quarter of a percent of my brain left wanting to switch on some recording device to capture <laughs> that beautiful um, scene, but it would have completely de um, disgraced it. You can't do that. I've noticed that you as well. You can't do it. You, know, no, you can't do impossible. that. Impossible. You can't share experiences like that in no. that way. It is impossible. And uh, with Lucifer, it was his sister bringing him home. We had nothing to do with that. She came in, attended a seminar, didn't even know exactly why she was there and what she was so supposed to do, and then it developed. Hmm. And suddenly he was in, and she was taken over by that part of her true self, just doing it. So good sisters are for <laughs> she was excellent. Yeah. Well, I asked for the big picture from you, and I certainly get the big picture. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't want to have it, don't ask. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I know this is it's 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 a lot of clarity from our last one, so I I totally appreciate it. I I I, yeah. I really do. There's no one like you, Harold. I have to say, you know, I talk with a whole bunch of people in my life, so. I appreciate your perspective and the work you've done in the diving and the spelunking and the healing and putting yourself out as a test subject, as you said. I think that's the real test of a, of a, of a scientist, right? Mm. Is got to put yourself in the middle <laughs> to see what comes out your end, so to speak. Mm. Maybe this was kind of the, the initial plan. Someone needed to be hosting those fractal events mm. without doing a mistake on the road. Mm. And um, this is kind of what I realized, that this weird opportunity to learn about what healing is without wasting a single session, mm. without learning anything. It was apparently, this is how it looks to me when I look backwards, just to make sure that those weekends work out. Mm. Amazing. Mm. Oh, my goodness. I can see why people seek you out. I, I wonder why you're looking for other work if you can do this. But I can also see this being very tiring on a basis it's, of doing it all the time. When 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 you're well trained doing it, doing it, it's it's close to boredom. Mm. And this is exactly what it needs to be when when you start to become a channel for things. It's good when you're not personally involved. And as long as things are a challenge, you know, am I going to make it right? Is it going to work this way? Then you get involved. And then the channel is not clear. When all the single aspects of a healing path have been there like 20 times, 30 times, 40 times, you know, exactly know how to do it. So like, okay, let's do it that way. Let's, let's let, let the process run through. And, you know, just contain it somehow. And uh, um, I think it's it's a saying coming even from, from Japanese martial arts when you train. Um, the tiny little challenges, take them with full awareness and the big challenges with ease. Mm. It's almost like you're not there. That's for sure. Yeah. And it can't work differently. It's true. 
And it's done, and it's done in the collective and for the collective. This is what counts. It doesn't matter how it happened. Hmm. It doesn't matter whether I was kind of a little fractal here or another fractal there or a core fractal. I don't know who else was involved in doing that. Maybe there are fractions I'm not even aware about that hmm. carried their part of the entire thing. Um, in a way, I remember there's a, a beautiful quote in the Bible when it came to, to this event of expelling us from paradise. There's one quote by source, don't worry, um, you will be allowed to return when the time will come. Hmm. So um, for source standing outside of the timelines, arranging the full adventure, Mm. Apparently, he knew exactly what he was doing. And this is where we can leave it. Yes, you will be allowed to return. This is great. Oh, my goodness. Mm. Harold, thank you so much. This is amazing. It has been amazing. I would love, you know, please stay on the line once we start recording. I have a couple of questions for you out there I'd like to ask. But mm. anybody has any other questions, suggestions, uh, ideas for Harold, for his business, for what he suggested with the wood and all the other ones, communities. There's a whole bunch of people coming towards us this year. We're doing things in Australia, some things in Canada, you know, perhaps some things developing in Europe as well, obviously, since that's where Harold is. And we're happy to uh, facilitate, put together, expose all those lovely things, help you out as possible for us. So please like and subscribe. You know, if you have any suggestions for Harold, I, I forward all of the questions to him over to him. And uh, we will be happy to pick this up on a future chat. At least I know I will be. Mm -hmm. I would like to promote someone, if I'm allowed to. You are. Because in, in the changed environment, kind of a quick fix is allowed. Okay. I love it. It's like now it's about the healing. It's not about creating blueprints, solving the mysteries, getting something into the reality that needs to be invented or whatever. It's just for us to return to the order. And um, I made friends with uh, Brent W. Davis. W. Davis. He's an, he's an American. Okay. And he is somehow connected to the kingdom of flowers. I love it. And he found a method to basically e extract the living spirit of a flower from the living plant. Hmm. You know, some people make essences by cutting the flower and then putting alcohol on top. And he found a method to basically preserve the living spirit. Hmm. And he's guided by those spirits to find the plants. So he's just interwoven with this entire kingdom of flowers and they pull him to the place, random places in the middle of the jungle where he's heading for 72 years old, kind of, mm -hmm. <laughs> still on adventures. And um, he contacted me and with the first email I got from him, the first flower essence he described as an example entered my system. And introduced itself to me. And that was an extremely ooh experience. Like, wow. Because mm -hmm. they, when, when they do healing on a client, those flower spirits, they are not embedded in the timeline like we are. They can That's move back and forth. That's for sure. So when they work on a trauma, they can go to the point in the timeline before the trauma hmm. uh, occurred and pull the healthy spirit back into the now. Hmm. Something hmm. we as healers can't do that. And it's it's it appeared like a like a beautiful kind of presence, a present of source. Hmm. Um to just to, to to help humanity to clear the big amount of mess we are still stuck in. All for flowers, I love them. By by having by having those helpers around, and um, are you going to share a link with us? Then will you send it to me afterwards, and I'll I'll put it down uh, below for the so-called products. Or do you want to tell me now? It's 
easy floor floor alive flora life flora live with the b flora live yeah dot com f l o r a l i v e dot com and his yeah. name is w davis um brent brent w davis oh brent brent first first brent w davis well i would be i'm gonna check it up as soon as we're out there i'm a flower man myself i've been in mm -hmm. shitty shitty moods and you smell one flower and i take a walk and everything mm -hmm. changes immediately so i i know the healing power that they can offer no doubt yeah uh, he's got a beautiful um um um, library of pictures, faces of clients before and after treatment. <laughs> it's kind of fun to go in. You know, I've got a half a dozen orchids growing myself over here all the time. They come into flower for me. So, mm. and they're just all blooming, even as we speak, you know, or starting mm. to. So for sure, this is great. Oh my goodness. I'm going to contact him myself. Uh, you know, Brent, if you're listening to this, mm. send me an email or I'll send you one. I'm happy to see what's possible for us. And it seems to me like this mm. is a lucky rabbit year. Harold, and I thank you for your part in it, for uh, perhaps, uh, you know, putting this beautiful community together that we'll get to do in our own way, preserved wood, flowers, healing, all the way back, you know, all, all of the lovely things that are possible. And I'm delighted to be a part of it as, as little or as big as the world says I should be doing. Okay, so I would say fire horse is greeting a white rabbit. Fire horse. Ah, you guys are, <laughs> you guys are interesting. Fire horses. I've met a few of you. Cool. We're not supposed to get along, and yet we do, from what I've heard, a fire horse and a white rabbit. So it's amazing. Yeah. I'm happy for it. I get along with all kinds of uh, animals, so to speak. I'm not supposed to. So I guess maybe this is that time. But but but, but you're not the white rabbit from Alice. No, you? not at all. No, I'm a, because I'm a I followed one into that hole. <laughs> no, I'm a water rabbit, I believe, from where I was born. Okay. Yes, not a white one, but a water one. Harold, thank you so much. I appreciate you being here once again. I'll be in touch. Uh, everybody, once again, like, subscribe. I love you all very much. I appreciate your time. This has gone on to places I never imagined, as they always do. So uh, I hope you've enjoyed it as I have. And we'll be back again as our inspirations allow. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Can't make me lie, lie to my heart. No one tells me where I should start. Freedom first is what I say.